right. Thank you very much, Chris Alexander. And thank you, Saratoga Springs Public Library, uh, for being a great partner uh, these years and for hosting this virtual program, co-hosting this virtual program. Uh, we're happy to bring this program to all of you who have joined us tonight. Uh, I am excited to see this and because uh, it's so different and interesting, something we would never think about uh, when it comes to our birds that we love and watch. So uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, we, uh, Southern Adirondack Audubon has uh, uh, still on a hiatus our bird uh, walks. We will not be leading bird walks through the winter time and for now into the spring. Uh, we will, you know, as we approach the spring, we'll see uh, what the situation looks like and uh, we'll go from, you know, the spring and go from there. Uh, our next public program virtually will be co-hosted with the Crandall Public Library on Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. That is on Timber Tigers, uh, Chipmunks of the Adirondacks. And that will be uh, given by Charlotte Demers of the Adirondack Interpretive Center. We love having Charlotte in person, but I'm sure she'll be just as awesome in the virtual world. So uh, please take uh, keep an eye out for an email and our Facebook page for how to sign in to that particular uh, program. Uh, we are still Crandall Library, and we are we are still working with the Crandall Library to work out. Uh, exactly how everybody can view this and sign in. So just wanted to let you know there, um, our chapter is still having a Christmas bird count. Uh, it, it, we will be having our newsletter come out sometime between Thanksgiving and December 1st. Please check the newsletter to see when the uh, Christmas bird count is in that newsletter and um, how to contact uh, the person, the coordinator for that. Uh, we'll also announce it in an MailChimp and as well uh, on Facebook. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say right now. I don't wanna take up too much uh, extra time here. So uh, thank you all for coming and I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you all. Um, I, uh, I'm Chris Harbison. I, I've been at Siena for uh, about 12 years now. I'm glad to see some Siena alums in the, in the audience as well in English and biology and who knows what else. Um, great to have you here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of my uh, research interests over the past, uh, you know, 10, 15 years or so, uh, and hopefully give you a, a somewhat of a different There we go. Uh, maybe somewhat of a different perspective on, on birds that you haven't really thought of before, right? Um, I, I got into studying birds through kind of an odd angle. Most um, ornithologists will, will start studying birds from a very, very early life, you know, or early on in life, you know, I'll, from bird watching and on. And I, I did a little bit of that, but I really um, kind of got ex very excited about parasites. And I started kind of working my way into studying birds through studying their parasites. So. Um, this might give you a, a little bit of a different perspective on, on uh, the lovely feathered friends we're seeing out there. Um, so at Siena, I teach uh, the upper level evolution course. I'm pretty heavily involved in general biology and um, I am teaching currently an ornithology course, which has been great. We get all our students out in the field uh, every week and we've been having a lot of fun. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about adaptations for life within feathers. Um, uh oh, let's see here. There we go. Um, so uh, this little uh, rundown of where I'm going, I'm going to talk a little bit about coevolution and host parasite interactions in general. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, a lot of the adaptations that have resulted from this um, coevolution between birds and their hosts, right? How the birds adapted to the parasites, how the parasites counter adapted to uh, evade host defenses and exploit the host a bit better. Um, so uh, if I have time, I'm going to try to take that a little bit back to um, understanding uh, human evolution through our co-evolving parasites as well. Um, so when you think of, uh, of evolution, mo much of evolution that you're thinking of is, is probably co-evolution. 
right? Uh, and coevolution is, is basically uh, just reciprocal evolutionary change between interacting species. So when you have two species interacting and one uh, gets an adaptation that affects the other, the other one has to have a counter adaptation to, um, uh, to, the, to the first, right? A classic example would be uh, when Darwin um, saw this uh, Madagascar star orchid with this incredibly ridiculously long nectar spur, he hypothesized that there must be some hawk moth out there or a hummingbird or something with an incredibly long proboscis that would pollinate it, right? And over time, the nectar spur got longer and then the hawk moth had to evolve a longer proboscis, right? This is coevolutionary change. Um, a great place to look for coevolutionary change is in parasites. It's a little, little bit more of an antagonistic kind of thing, but um, when you think about parasites, um, roughly half the Earth's diversity is made up of parasites. Um, we don't typically think of this, but if, if every host had a, a parasite species that was specific only to that host, that would be about half the world's diversity there, right? Um, so it's an, if you wanna understand biodiversity, you have to understand parasites. Um, it's a great place to look for coevolution as well. There's it's extensive coevolution. They're, they're locked into this evolutionary arms race back and forth. Uh, and it's also great to study, right? Each host represents the entire ecosystem. So from a, from a biological perspective, if you wanna have a study with a bunch of different replicates, you can put you know, eight different birds, you have eight different experiments essentially. Um, and the parasites are also living in a much more simplified ecosystem than in a, a free living um, insect or, or, parasite, or, or a, a animal, right? So uh, a lot of the complicating factors are removed from the situation. So a lot of, a lot of interesting things to think about when you're thinking about parasites. Um, what I tend to get really interested in is, is understanding how reciprocal uh, evolution or coevolution has driven uh, kind of in the short term, some of the adaptations that birds have to uh, attack these parasites and the parasites have to counterattack. But over the much longer term as well, um, kind of understanding macroevolutionary trends that happen over millions of years, like why some host parasite lineages evolve so closely. Um, like for instance, um, these are pocket gophers and they're, uh, they're blood feeding lice, right? Uh, so this is a host phylogeny or a family tree. Let me see if I can get a little... Um, uh, well, that's not the right thing I need to get. Um, oh, darn. I was gonna get a little pointer here, but uh, that's all right. Um, uh, these guys over here, right? This is the, the family tree for the, um, uh, the hosts, right? And you know, this is an ancient species that split into two different species and their parasites split along with them as well, right there, right? Every time you have speciation in the host, you get speciation in the parasite. They're locked together and those phylogenies can almost fit across each other like a, like a glove, right? And over here, you have uh, another parasite species. These are um, gill parasites, monogeneans on fish. And this fish host over here, uh, and you try to um, uh, get these phylogenies together and it forms this kind of a tangled mess, right? Each one of these parasites is on multiple host species. There's constant host switching back and forth. So trying to understand that the ecological factors that might cause one lineage to diversify in tandem with each other and others to switch all the time is, is of interest. Um, most of our um, human parasites and pathogens uh, recently jumped from other species to us, right? Uh, so understanding what are some of the ecological factors that would drive one lineage down this route and another lineage down this route are of interest. And so uh, bird parasites are a great place to, to start asking these questions. Um, so the, the, let me introduce you to the parasite we'll be talking about today. Uh, these are feather feeding lice. So um, every bird out there has uh, usually a couple species of lice that live on them. Some of them are blood feeding, the, the ones I'll be talking about mainly today are feather feeding. Um, so their entire diet is, is feathers and they, they digest these feathers with the aid of uh, bacteria that live in their guts uh, that help um, produce vitamins and other things that are missing from their diet but they're highly evolved to, to life on birds and on the feathers, right? They have little mandibles right here that will um, uh, chomp up feather barbs. Their uh, legs have little tarsal claws that are great for climbing on feathers, but they're largely immobile off the hosts. Um, these guys are insects, right? You can see there's six legs right there. They're two little antenna, but they're about the size of a sesame seed. They're very, very small. And they cement their eggs to the host um, and spend their entire life cycle on that host. Um, they have been around with birds for a very long time, right? Uh, so this is the only fossil we have of a louse species. 
It's 44 million years old, and it looks a heck of a lot like um, like our current uh, Laos species right here from uh, from uh, what is that from a swan? Yes. Uh, there's a little crop right here where they store their feathers. You can see their crop over there in the Laos fossil as well, right? And you can use this to kind of date a molecular tree. So this is a molecular tree, uh, a family tree of all these uh, different Laos species. And you can kind of calibrate this tree with that fossil and use what's called a molecular clock to date back when the origins of these Laos species were. And it's about 100 to 140 million years ago when these uh, parasites came on the scene. So this is uh, probably when dinosaurs started uh, evolving feathers, these lice probably jumped on these dinosaurs to hop along for the ride and, and take advantage of that unique uh, niche. And then they diversified into birds. So there's been plenty of time for these birds and the parasites to co-evolve together and develop adaptations in response to one another. Um, so uh, what do these guys do to their hosts? Why are they harmful? Um, they're, they're basically their entire diet is feather barbs, right? And so this is a regular feather over here. Um, can you guys see this little cursor I'm moving around? Yes, okay. Um, this is a, 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 the feather barbs over here and they'll basically lock onto the, one of those feather barbs and chomp their way up the feather barb until you get something like this, a completely denuded um, uh, insulative feather, right? They don't eat the outer feathers, the flight feathers and the, and the, tough, uh, the tougher feathers out there. They, they only focus on the insulative feathers inside. So a bird might look good from the outside, but on the inside, they're having a lot of trouble staying warm. So um, if you increase loss abundance, you decrease their feather mass, the bird has to ramp up their metabolism because they're losing a lot of uh, body heat, especially over the winter. Uh, and this gives them kind of like a one-two punch to their fitness, right? They, uh, they lose body mass and they are, um, uh, uh, that reduces their overwinter survival. Right? And then they also don't have enough energy to display to potential mates. So they're losing out on reproduction as well. So survival and reproduction are the two measures of, of biological fitness. Um, this is kind of like a chronic condition. Uh, if, if you look at most birds out there, uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to 80% of the population will have feather lice on them. So they're constantly trying to battle these um, feather feeding lice. Oh, let's see, there we go. Um, so how do birds fight back? Um, you guys have all seen this in action. Um, birds spend about 15 or so percent of their daily time budget grooming, uh, preening through their feathers, right? Uh, some of this is to clean out debris and to relock those feather barbs together and the flight feathers. But a lot of what they're doing is trying to kill parasites, right? Uh, so lice select for very efficient preening in birds and they select against birds with minor bill deformities. Um, and we know this because if you um, impair grooming or preening, louse loads start skyrocketing. But it turns out there's actually one specific aspect of bill morphology that turns out to be really important in how birds groom. Um, so you may not have noted this, noticed this too much, but if you take a really close look at most bird bills, they have a little tiny overhang here where the upper mandible overhangs the lower mandible, right? It's only maybe two, three millimeters long, but it turns out this is a really important tool for grooming. Um, these researchers, um, they, they trimmed the little overhang off just using a Dremel tool. It, it'll grow back just like a, a fingernail grows back in a couple of weeks. And so they trimmed these guys on two groups of birds. This is the number of lice on the y-axis here and this time over the x-axis here. And on both those groups of birds, their louse loads started skyrocketing as soon as they got rid of that little tiny two millimeter overhang. Um, at this point here, at uh, weeks 16 or 18 or so, they allowed one group to regrow that overhang. And as they regrew that overhang, the last load started plummeting again, right? Which it really shows that this one little tiny piece of the bill is really essential for, um, for killing parasites. And what they're actually doing is they're taking their lower mandible and they're moving it back and forth against that overhang 30 times a second, which is really fast. Um, and they're creating a shearing force that is, uh, is pretty damaging to these parasites. So the, the analogy, I guess, would be trying to, to kill a tick, which I see plenty of ticks now these days. You, if you try to kill them and by squeezing it like this, you're not gonna do well. But if you put a shearing force on it, you can really do some damage. And that's what this lower mandible is doing, uh, hitting that overhang, right? So is it sufficient to kill lice? 
Well, these are lice from underneath uh, one of the bird cages. Uh, this is an SEM of them. Uh, and you can see this one, you know, has <laughs> decapitated. This one got uh, crushed over there, right? This is really uh, an effective tool for, for killing off these parasites. So the, the classic example of, of, of selection influencing bill morphology is, is Darwin's finches, right? Where you have uh, larger seeds select for larger bills, smaller seeds, smaller bills. Uh, but there are other uh, selective forces that are shaping bill morphology as well. Um, and nearly all birds have a little tiny overhang over there unless it gets in the way of their feeding. Um, so it seems to be a pretty universal tool for killing off these parasites. And this is their main defense against these parasites. Um, other adaptations for controlling all these ectoparasites. Um, this is a, a black skimmer here. This is not roadkill. Uh, this, what this guy is actually doing here, this is, is uh, what's called sunning behavior, which you uh, may have seen before. Um, a lot of bird species will get out, especially on really hot days, kind of flatten their bodies and spread out their feathers. And you might think, why are they doing this on a hot day? This seems like it's really counterintuitive. Uh, but it's seen in, in over 50 families of birds. Um, sunning does happen to, to warm birds up and things like that, but the sunning behavior I'm talking about is what's taking place on really, really hot days where you're already very hot and they put their feathers out like this. Uh, and what they're probably doing is, is killing the parasites with heat or at least making the parasites uncomfortable enough to start moving around so that they can kill them uh, with their preening, right? So um, if you put lice on a wing, on a fake wing, and expose them to similar temperatures, some of them uh, will die off. Uh, and it kind of raises the, the interesting question that there might be selection for darker plumage in birds that, that engage in this sunning behavior a lot. Um, so this is a, another interesting way that, that birds have, or a tool in their, in their toolkit to, um, to attack these parasites. Um, for birds that have uh, really unwieldy bills, right? Uh, uh, or, or, or try to get those hard to reach places where you can't get with a bill. Um, scratching also uh, is a, a frequent, uh, frequently seen in grooming and this likely helps uh, control ectoparasites as well. Uh, this is how mammals uh, mostly control their ectoparasites. Um, and in some birds, uh, this may compensate for, uh, for a lack of other methods like birds with really unwieldy bills that, or, or bills that are missing an overhang. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, one line of uh, evidence suggesting that is, you know, birds with very unwieldy bills will scratch for 16% of their grooming time versus 2% of the grooming time with uh, birds that have uh, regular uh, normal size bills and overhangs. Um, another thing that has evolved in a, a few lineages like barn owls and um, uh, some herons and others is this, uh, what's called a pectinate claw. Uh, it looks an awful lot, but actually, you know what, I have one right here. Um, this is a, a Peruvian louse comb right here. Uh, um, they, uh, they, uh, they, this is essentially like a little uh, mini louse comb on the end of your uh, claw right here. Uh, and uh, the, the little tines of the comb will kind of sort, uh, go through the feather and then pick up all the parasites. Um, we know this does work because if you, if you um, trim off or shave off part of the pectinite claw, um, the, the louse loads start increasing, right? So this is a, uh, the number of claw teeth you have here and uh, birds that have more claw teeth uh, tend to not have as many lice than birds with uh, fewer claw teeth. So we've got preening, we've got scratching, we've got sunning. Um, another interesting behavior is dusting, which uh, you've probably seen birds uh, in dust baths moving around and stuff. Uh, the people have hypothesized that this might help kill ectoparasites. It, the abrasiveness of it might uh, wreck their cuticle. Um, this has never really been tested, but that'd be an interesting thing to test. Um, and the other one that is um, not definitively uh, known as an as a anti-parasite defense, but most likely is, is a behavior called anting, which is uh, seen in over 200 species, uh, mostly songbirds, where they will either passively ant, well, they'll sit on top of an ant nest and let the ants crawl around their body, or they will actively ant where they'll grab an ant in their bill and they'll squeeze it and anoint themselves with all the little formic acid to presumably kill off parasites. Um, the reason why we think it might kill parasites is they're only using ants that secrete formic acid, which would be uh, uh, problematic for any parasites on their body. 
Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that it kills mice. Uh, not mice, mites, not mice, mites. Uh, it kills lice in the lab, but they're, they're conflicting reports from, from field tests. So we're, we're, we're still looking into this one a bit more. Um, but just out of interest, um, some other items that birds use to anoint themselves besides ants are um, things that are, are kind of really smelly or have nasty compounds, right? Millipedes, caterpillars, um, citrus fruits, lawn chemicals, mothballs sometimes, right? So um, uh, most likely a way to try to kill parasites. But really the main defense against uh, these parasites is preening. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, things from the bird perspective, right? What you're familiar with, uh, something you may not be as familiar with, we'll, we'll talk about here is from the parasite perspective. So when you're out there looking at a bird next time uh, and you see it preening, really think about, oh, what's going on in there, right? Um, there's a whole community of parasites that live in or on uh, the feathers, right? Mites, flies, ticks, lice, um, all sorts of um, parasites that are living on these birds. There's like a, a community of, of, of little parasites in there. And they've had to adapt to this main defense, which is the bird preening. Um, so one of the ways lice have evolved to escape host grooming is uh, it, it appears that they are cryptically colored, right? They're, they have evolved camouflage coloration. Um, and if preening is the main defense, which is, uh, can involve visual cues, right? They see the lice and then they attack them, right? There should be selection for cryptic coloration. And if you take sister species, um, uh, that shared a recent common ancestor. One bird evolved dark coloration, one bird evolved light coloration, and you look at their lice, here's uh, what you get, right? Um, you get the, the white birds have white lice, the dark birds have dark lice, and, and this seems to, to hold for a lot of different species, right? So it suggests that there's a, a visual component to preening, and it also is the only known case that I'm aware of of, of camouflage coloration evolving in, in parasites. So this is uh, kind of neat. Um, these parasites also have to really specialize on, uh, on where they are living on the host as well. Um, so in case of the, the ones I study the most, these are called wing lice. They'll actually migrate out to the flight feathers of the wings and the tail, and they'll insert their bodies in between the feather barbs of uh, uh, those real rough feather barbs of those uh, flight feathers. Uh, this is uh, the analogy I like to use sometimes don't you know don't don't ever try this but if you if you lie down in a train track right and and, and between the train tracks and the train can kind of go over you right um, don't do that but uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of what they're trying to accomplish here right by inserting in between these feather barbs they're hiding from preening and they'll spend about 90 percent of their lives just resting inserted in between these um, feather barbs of uh, the wings and the tail the problem is that they, they need to migrate back and forth every few days to the body to feed on those really insulative, fluffy, downy feathers, right? So the question I started, uh, uh, some of my students got interested in, in asking was, well, how are they able to accomplish this migration from the wings to the body and back and forth? Uh, their vision is, is rudimentary at best, right? Um, there are, might be chemical cues they could be following, uh, but my, my students really started thinking, well, what if they were following temperature cues, right? Um, if you, this is kind of a heat map of a bird, uh, a thermal camera image. Um, and if you look at a parasite that's living on the, um, on the tail, right? If it follows warmer temperatures, it should go to the body regions, which are about 36 degrees C. Or if you're on the wings, right? You just can kind of track your way over this way or track your way up that way and just kind of follow heat gradients on the bird to try to figure out where you are and to migrate from the flight feathers where you hide to the body regions where you feed. So we had to test whether lice were even capable of, of using thermal cues. And um, so we set up a little uh, uh, quick experiment here where we uh, apply heat up at the top of this little Petri dish arena. And there's a little louse right here. It's, it's dark uh, just to um, keep things, um, uh, keep, keep too many stimulus from, from uh, uh, messing with our experiment here. And we painted little uh, fabric paint dots on this guy so we could motion track them. And when you let them loose, they kind of orient a little bit here, make a couple really wide turns, and then they lock onto that thermal cue and go right up that heat gradient to uh, right here, which is uh, right about bird body temperature. All right, so they're, um, I, I won't get too deep into the, the, the data of this here, but um, we, we were able to show that lice are really, um, not, uh, they're pretty darn good at, at 
testing very, very slight differences in, in, um, uh, in the temperature gradients and tracking uh, where they want to go. Um, so we then kind of asked, well, okay, they're capable of, of sensing thermal cues and responding to them, right, and orienting to them. Are they able to use that knowledge to, to kind of track from where they are hiding to where they are, um, are going to feed, right, going from flight feathers to body regions? So we, we forced lice to choose between temperatures associated with the flight feathers over here, cooler temperatures, and the warmer temperatures of the body regions. And when you have a well-fed louse, uh, it prefers temperatures out here where they spend 90% of their lives, and that's not terribly surprising. But if you starve a lice for 18 hours and prevent them from feeding, right, they start shifting their temperature preferences towards those of the body where they like to feed, right, which suggests that they're able to use these temperature gradients on the bird to figure out where they are and to navigate around on the bird. Um, another thing that might be going on, right, that might help them locate different areas on the bird or locate each other, right, how do you find a mate on a giant bird if you're the size of a sesame seed, right, um, is potentially pheromone communication. And so this is something we've been looking into the last few years as well. Um, we noticed that all these lice tend to congregate in, in clumps on the flight feathers. You'll see a, a feather with like 10 or 15 of them and then none over here, right? So they're kind of clumping together. This might help them to get, get protection from preening, the safety in numbers kind of thing, or it might help uh, facilitate finding a mate, but it also might help them um, navigate from uh, different regions to find the flight feathers again, right? Uh, they might be helping each other locate those flight feathers after they're done feeding. So the question then is, are they using pheromones to form these aggregations? Uh, and many insects have alarm pheromones, aggregation pheromones. Um, you know, pheromone communication is very, very important in insects. So the way we first started attacking this here was we uh, used what's called a Y-tube olfactometer, where you send air down either one of these tubes. You put a little louse at the bottom here, and it walks up the tube, and it decides which arm to go up. Right? And we can put different combinations of feathers and parasites in one arm or the other and decide, okay, are they, are they attracted to the scent from lice? Um, and we found when you put lice over here on, on feathers, about 70 to 80% are going to move this way towards those, uh, those conspecifics, those other, other lice, right? Or to the lousy scent, we'll say, right? Um, and so that they are emitting, these guys are emitting pheromones that are, are seeping their way down here and these guys are tracking that pheromone cue or the pheromone trail up there. So they're able to talk to each other with pheromones. Um, we also found that uh, lice only produce these pheromones when they're placed on flight feathers. If they're in there by themselves they don't make pheromones. If they're in there on body feathers they don't make pheromones but as soon as you put them on flight feathers where they like to aggregate then they start producing these aggregation pheromones. Um, we also saw differences in male and female responses as well, uh, suggesting there are male and female specific pheromones, probably mating pheromones. So to test what these are, um, we, uh, we went on a little bit of a fishing expedition here, and uh, we use what's called uh, SPME and GCMS. Uh, so SPME is solid phase micro extraction. It's basically a long needle here that you stick into a vial full of lice on feathers, and all the chemicals that are emitted will glom onto that needle, right? You take that needle out and then put it in a gas chromatograph mass spectroscopy machine. And this separates out all those chemicals. It heats them all up and sends them down this big long tube and it separates them by charge and mass. And you come out with data that looks like this, right? And so um, all these peaks kind of represent different molecules that are working their way through that tube. Um, and you can see a little bit from this, right? If you have just feathers in there, it produces a certain signal, right? Feathers are emitting some, some uh, volatile chemicals. But there are also, when you put lice on there as well, they're emitting their own chemicals on top of that. So if you kind of subtract the two, you can figure out what chemicals the lice are emitting. And you can send that into a computer that has a library of what all these chemicals look like, and it'll spit back a chemical that you, uh, is likely the, the, the chemical of interest. I hope that made sense. Um, so we're basically um, comparing all the volatile chemicals that are on uh, lice on feathers, where they like to make their pheromones, and then just feathers by themselves and saying, okay, what, what's different, right? What are these lice producing? Uh, and so using that, this is a kind of a readout from one of the runs we did. 
Uh, you can see a lot of these chemicals will pop out like uh, heptanoic acid, nonalol, octanoic acid, all these kind of little short uh, nine or 10 chain um, uh, carbon molecules, right? That are probably byproducts of metabolism. Um, some of them which uh, have been uh, kind of converted into pheromones. But we don't know which ones are pheromones and which ones are just chemicals that are being emitted into the air. Um, so to do that, we've take all these candidate pheromones and we put them on a little Petri dish. Uh, you put the little pheromone there and put little control dots of solvents over there and just track the lice and see where they go. Uh, if they're attracted to that chemical, then we know it's likely a, um, a pheromone, right? So, uh, so far we've found uh, these guys are attracted to ammonia. That's a, a very common insect um, uh, attractant. It's in a lot of insect traps actually. Um, and then what, are, what they're using is, is pheromones are likely things like hexanoic acid, octanoic acid, um, uh, in the females, non and all, benzaldehyde. So we're, we're kind of slowly trying to unlock their language, right? And if you understand how parasites are talking with one another, you might be able to figure out better strategies to uh, combat these parasites as well. Um, so we're, that work is, is ongoing. We just uh, discovered another chemical yesterday, which uh, we're, we're gonna start testing over the winter and, uh, and we're, we're off and running. So this is a kind of a fun project that's ongoing and. Uh, it's gotten me doing way more chemistry than I was initially comfortable with, but it's been, a, it's been great. Um, so that's a little bit about how parasites might kind of adapt to, uh, to the host, right? Uh, so some of the adaptations the host has to combat the parasite, some of the things that the parasite is doing to, uh, to better exploit the host and to better evade those host defenses. Um, I think I have time to talk about this a little bit. Um, thinking kind of more long-term macroevolutionary trends, uh, I want to get back to this question of, of why some host parasite lineages evolve so closely over time and other ones are so loosely associated, right? Um, when you think of, of uh, pigeons, I'm not sure I even mentioned those, those wing lice I study, um, they're, they're from the common everyday rock pigeon, rock dove, right? Um, and this is a, a great group to, to look at because there are, you know, little tiny, uh, you know, ground doves that are almost sparrow sized, almost turkey sized Victoria crown pigeons, right? And they all have um, two species of, of louse that live on them. So we talked a lot about wing lice and every one of these birds has a wing louse species. And uh, the one I didn't mention are, uh, all these guys are also host to body lice and they typically have both of them at the same time. Um, body lice only live on the body and their defense is to just run like crazy, right? When a, when a host starts preening, they just, start burrowing into the feathers as much as they can. They're a little shorter, rounder. Um, but everybody, every, every one of these um, columbiforms, pigeons and doves has a, a species of wing louse and a species of body louse, just about every one. So they're kind of like, um, uh, it, it, it's like a, a, a nice little experiment we have here, right? If we track the evolution of this host, uh, this parasite with the host and that parasite with the host, we can see if there are any, any patterns. Right. The problem with trying to compare what's happening with a pocket gopher louse with, and, and a monogenean fish parasite, they're, they're so different. It's hard to, to really understand what's, you know, what difference in their biology is causing these guys to jump ship all the time. Right. These guys live in the exact same host, feed in the exact same thing, feathers, right, and, uh, and have evolved with the exact same hosts. Right. So um, if you look at a phylogeny of the New World doves here, and their body lice, you can see this is a real extensive co-evolution, right? Every one of these red dots is an inferred co-speciation event, where uh, this guy speciated into two lineages down here, and over here, right, they co-speciated along with it. So you can kind of, the, the parasites are kind of uh, stuck on these doves, and they're not able to switch hosts uh, very easily, right? If you look at wing lice, uh, you can see there's been a lot more of a messy interaction here, right? Uh, there are, is some co-speciation, right? Like these guys co-speciated with this group over here, but there's a lot of things like uh, host switching events as well, right? So let me, let me point out two things here, right? This would be an example of a host switching event, right? This columbicola baculoides, which should be on this guy over here, right? But it's switched host over to the morning dove over here, right? Um, the other kind of interesting natural history not to point out here, is this uh, species up here is Columbicola extinctus. And they describe this species from the now extinct passenger pigeon. And they assume since the passenger pigeon went extinct, the parasite went extinct along with it. 
until more recently they found it on the band-tailed pigeon out west and they realized that uh, the, the species had come back to life again, but it still has the extinctest name. <laughs> so interesting side note. Um, all right, uh, so the question then is, you know, what's driving this big difference here, right? Wing and body lace have very different co-evolutionary histories with the same bird host, right? Uh, and it can be explained by differences in host switching. One of these guys is much better at switching hosts than the other guy, right? And this causes the body lace to just be stuck on there, whereas the wing lace are jumping ship and infecting new species, right? So this, you know, when you start thinking about all the human pathogens out there jumping ship, you wanna know, well, how are, they, how are they getting there? How are they jumping between species? Well, it turns out these guys, I, I did a lot of work um, uh, back when I was at the University of Utah trying to figure this question out. And one of the things that we started looking at was um, hippobosid flies. Uh, so these are uh, flies that are closely related to the tsetse flies uh, in Africa. Uh, and they're on many different bird species. They're called flat flies. They're, they're kind of dorsoventrally flattened. Uh, and they're, they're really good at running around in the feathers, almost like spiders. Um, but they're also very generalist. They'll live on many different species of hosts, right? Whereas lice will only live on one or two different species. Um, so what the idea is here is that if these lice are jumping on these flies, they can switch between hosts of the same species, or they can jump ship and land on the host of a different species and, and engage in a host switching event, right? And so we ran a bunch of experiments kind of testing the ability of lice to do this um, and to switch between species. And it turns out uh, that the wing lice will actually seek out these flies Right, they're attracted to these flies, they'll hop on the flies, and uh, we were able to experimentally demonstrate that they will move between hosts of the same species and hosts of different species as well. Uh, and we were able to simulate a lot of host switching events in, in lab conditions. I, I won't um, get too into the, to the details. Um, body lice, on the other hand, un they're not capable of hanging onto the flies, they're not attracted to the flies, and this may be one of the large, larger, uh, one of the main reasons why you see these guys stuck on their hosts and these guys switching all the time. So just one little aspect of the community, like adding another community member and might completely change the coevolutionary dynamics between hosts and parasite. All right, so phoresis is also a very common phenomenon out there. Um, Darwin was actually one of the first people to, um, to describe this. And the last paper he wrote um, was uh, uh, about um, the phoresis of clams on the feet of ducks and amphibians and all that. And he actually got some of the samples from a shoemaker in, in um, I believe it was in Northampton, who happened to be Francis Crick's grandfather <laughs> of, of Watson and Crick. So another interesting kind of natural history side note there. All right, so quick summary up till now. Um, and then I'll, I'll briefly talk about um, human evolution as well. Uh, so adaptations of both host and parasite are shaped by reciprocal selection on one another, right? On the bird side, uh, there's selection for efficient preening, for a bill overhang, for sunning behavior, all, all those types of behaviors that might kill the parasites. And the parasites have had to counter ad, uh, uh, engage or evolve counter adaptations like uh, cryptic coloration, um, thermo orientation and pheromone communication to help aid in their navigation around the host. Um, specialization of, of wing lice and body lice in different regions of the bird, or even uh, different transmi transmission mechanisms like uh, phoretic dispersal on, on flies. Um, and hopefully you're, you'll able, you're able to see that experiments on, on modern day species can really help us figure out these ecological interactions, like just the simple act of, of, of riding on a fly, right? Could really underlie long-term evolutionary patterns such as host switching, co-speciation and other kind of really macroevolutionary trends. Uh, but since we're talking about host switching and congruent phylogenies and things like that, um, I think it would be uh, of interest also to kind of jump away from birds for a sec and, and talk about humans just for a minute uh, and how you can use co-evolving parasites to understand human evolution as well. Um, and just two real quick stories here and then I, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, Studying one lineage can help shed light on the co-evolving partner lineage, right? So if you understand what's happening with the parasites, it might shed light on what's happening on the human side of things, right? And this is a, um, a graph of uh, millions of years here, right? And all of our ancestors uh, across Asia, Africa, Europe, right? And so a long time ago, about um, 1.2 million years ago, 
um, our lineage split into um, that that led to Homo erectus and then the lineage that led to Neanderthals and us, right? We then spread worldwide very recently out of Africa uh, about 100,000 years ago or so. And a big question is as we moved out of Africa and went through Southeast Asia and up and over the Bering Lands Bridge and all that, did we, did we interact with any of these other human lineages, right? Uh, and our parasites have a little bit to say about that. Right? Uh, did we make contact with these ancient um, hominins in Asia as we went through up and over to that land bridge? Well, we could go get a time machine and figure this out, right? Or we could do the, the next closest thing to a time machine, which is a, a PCR machine, right? This is how, how you analyze DNA. And if you look at the DNA of all these different louse species and make a big phylogeny or family tree of this, it really provides some interesting insights here, right? Um, so just like with the, um, the, the pocket gophers and their lice or the birds and their body lice, we also co-evolve with our own louse species. Um, so this is um, whenever um, humans and our ancient lineage, right, uh, that our common ancestor with chimps, when we split and evolved into chimps and humans, our parasites split along with us, right? Uh, so there's been a lot of co-evolution between um, primates and our parasites as well, our lice. Right, so if we understand what happened to the louse, we might be able to get a better understanding of what happened on the human side of things. Um, and if you make a phylogeny, this, uh, uh, this is work by David Reed and some others down at the University of Florida and University of Utah. Uh, they made a big phylogeny of all the, the head lice, you know, all our children get in schools and things like that. And it turns out there are two big lineages. One lineage is a worldwide group right here and they, um, and then another lineage is this kind of group that's only found in new world populations. And they share a common uh, ancestor about 1.2 million years ago. Um, this blue lineage here doesn't really show much of evidence of a giant population explosion. This worldwide group really kind of carries that genetic signature of a rapid population expansion of about 100,000 years ago, right? Which mirrors what was happening to the human population. So what they think might have happened was we can kind of track what was happening on this graph over here by looking at the phylogeny over here, right? And at about 1.2 million years ago was right about the time when our lineage split with the Homo erectus lineage. And what probably happened just like it happens on birds and other mammals is our louse species kind of split as well with them, right? So that ancient head louse lineage split right here into these two red lineage that came with us and this blue lineage that went with uh, other hominins like Homo erectus, right? So they evolved in isolation, but they didn't quite speciate yet, right? What this suggests then is that modern humans up here must have reacquired that ancient head loss lineage when they met as we came through Asia on our way up and over the land bridge. And that's why we find this uh, new world group on uh, uh, these head lice on uh, humans that are found in, in new world populations, right? So this kind of uh, is an interesting way to think about how ancient human populations came into contact by, by studying what happened with our parasite lineages. Or one more very quick one. Um, if you wanna know when we started using clothing, right? Um, uh, anthropologists have estimated, well, anywhere between 40,000 and 3 million years ago is when we started using clothing. That's a really long, estimate, right? But if you study lice, uh, you know that we have both head lice and we have body lice. And the body lice uh, will live in our clothing, they'll lay our eggs in our clothing and then come down to our body to feed and then migrate out to the clothing to, uh, to hide, kind of like the wing lice on birds. But you can't have body lice until you have clothing, right? Body lice evolved from head lice as soon as we started using clothing. So if you can date the, uh, the common ancestor of head lice and body lice or clothing lice, you can get a pretty good estimate of when we started using clothes. Uh, and uh, David Reed also, again, uh, with some other researchers, uh, made an estimate of this um, using genetic data and they, they estimated, they really narrowed that range down to between 80 and 170,000 years ago, probably just prior to leaving uh, Africa. Um, Alan, uh, Alan Alda did a great uh, little uh, excerpt on this on, uh, on uh, science now at one point. 
So um, if you want to um, have more fun with this, right, you can go to this uh, thing called timetree.org and you can enter two different taxa and it'll tell you when they shared a common ancestor. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so you'll have to have to test that out. Um, so anyway, that uh, hopefully you um, were learned a little bit more about uh, what was happening inside the bird feathers uh, today. Uh, so next time you're out there watching birds, you can uh, you can start thinking about the community that's living in and on them. Um, a lot of this work was done uh, at University of Utah and at Siena with the help of a lot of different undergraduates. So I wanted to, to thank all of them.